Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the monthly PCS Safety Reps Network meeting. Uh, my name is Tracy Edwards. I'm the PCS National Health and Safety Officer. Um, and tonight we're going to discuss um, the value of psychotherapy uh, for trade union safety reps. Um, and I'm really pleased uh, that we're joined by Sonia Stojanovic, um, who's a former customs officer um, at Heathrow and, and PCS rep, she's also a PCS arms member, a volunteer um, at Harrow Women's Centre um, and a trained uh, psychotherapist. And, and hopefully tonight um, is the is the, 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 the beginning of a um, you know a, a wider discussion um, around how we tackle uh, things like uh, work work related stress, our understanding um, around uh, trauma, um, and really arming ourselves with with more knowledge um, around human nature and and psychology. Um, really, because you know knowledge is power. Uh, our trade union reps and our safety reps um, are very um, you know very well educated. Um, and they're very well informed, um, and hopefully this will be um, a good uh, contribution to that, um, with the aim of gaining a better understanding of what a an, an holistic uh, approach uh, would look like um, in terms of uh, dealing with uh, work-related stress um, and how we can, um, you know, support, you know, uh, provide a better uh, uh, service in terms of um, individual representation uh, of members and getting better outcomes in terms of when we're representing um, members, but also crucially as well, you know, how we can arm ourselves uh, with, with this information uh, in order to collectivise, uh, you know, the issues around work-related stress, bullying at work, toxic workplaces, whatever uh, that might that might be, um, and to begin to organise on the basis um, of, um, you know, uh, us playing a role in assisting workers uh, to take back uh, control and a say over their workplace um, and how work um, is managed. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to hand over to uh, the expert, which is uh, Sonia, and Sonia is going to deliver um, a presentation now, which I will screen share. Thank you, Tracy. Yes, tonight I'm going to talk about the value of psychotherapy to trade union health and safety reps. And uh, I think it's helpful to understand more about human psychological processes to uh, support our members and to support our reps. And I really want to build on um, Janet Newsham's video, um, which, which was very helpful in, in talking about stress mental health issues um, that um, she touched on. And um, I think it's also good to consider uh, when trade union reps need some support and self-care doing personal casework, because um, there can be a risk of emotional contagion from the member. You know, the, these issues can be very emotive and uh, the, the member can transfer uh, some of these negative emotions and stress and anxiety onto the rep. So it's important that there is care out there for the reps as well. And, um, you know, enhanced knowledge in this area can help with recognising aspects of psychological detriment as health and safety risks when the management side often does not have that depth of knowledge to identify those. So Tracy, if we could have the next slide, please. Um, this evening, I'm going to have a look at uh, stress and trauma and uh, I'll offer perspectives on stress and trauma that may be a bit different from the purely medical descriptors. Uh, and, you know, difference is a good thing because it offers some challenge and it can be helpful to challenge the management side with a perspective that, that may be outside their comfort zone. So if we could have the next slide, please. Yeah, so um, these are perspectives on stress that I'm going to talk about. That's super, thank you. Um, uh, we're going to look at uh, different perspectives of stress um, such as, you know, workplace stress in a life context. So the basic popular interpretation of stress, the uh, holistic approach, I'll be taking a person centered view of stress and stressors and some existential analysis. We'll be looking at a philosophical representation of a person's life world. And then with living in bad faith, I'll be considering suppression and denial. And uh, in the authentic response to, to stress, I'll be looking at taking control when engaging with stress. 
So if we could have the next slide, please. So workplace stress in a life context. And these are well-known symptoms of stress that people feel life overload. And I'm sure many of you have heard the example of the stress bucket, where the stress bucket is like a person's personal container for stress. And when so much life stress goes into this stress bucket that they can't contain it anymore, it overflows, leading to um, stress-related uh, illnesses. And um, stress generates a fight, flight or freeze response, as we know, which is a result of the production of stress hormones, adrenaline and cortisol. And uh, when the body is in a continuous state of high alert, this can cause negative physical symptoms such as sleep disturbance, appetite fluctuation, headaches, palpitations, muscle tension, body aches. Um, and people feeling drained and tired all the time. And I know that Janet's slide offers uh, a far more extensive list, but um, you know, this is the, the kind of quite a medical way of looking at it. And, and all these things are popularly found in occupational health reports and, and well-known remedies um, often suggested in a workplace context are, are like self-care, like taking time out, do some yoga, have a go at some meditation, preferably with a scented candle. And none of these will make you feel any worse. In fact, you might get a lot out of it. But do they really put you in control? I would say probably not. So if we could have the next slide, please. Yeah, if we could have that. Yeah, great. So looking first at the holistic approach to, to stress, and uh, the, the Health and Safety Executive Stress Risk, risk Assessment is a good starting point as uh, it offers the opportunity to look at all aspects of um, a person's life. And uh, Janet Newsham in her slide recommends that line managers should go with it, with, with members. Um, but difficulty is, do line managers generally you know, understand uh, the deeper aspects of the questions on it. You know, I do think that's doubtful. And I think it's always an advantage if the union rep has got a better understanding of psychological issues than management, which, you know, I get the feeling sometimes is, is really not that hard. So um, that's really a good place to start. And uh, taking a person-centered view of the, the member and the situations that they're confronting um, is always very helpful. And a person-centered view comes from a theory um, for person-centered counseling developed by a psychotherapist called Carl Rogers in the 1950s and 60s. And the starting point is the value of the person, that the person has real value. And this sometimes contradicts, the, you know, the, an HRE approach, which makes people feel like they're a bum on a seat or a cog in a wheel. One size has to fit in all molds. And, you know, that's very stressful in itself. And really, we should be looking at people as individuals in their, in their own right. And in the opening conversation, um, you know, it's helpful to explore the person's life world, to actively listen to them and give them empathy, authenticity and respect. And I mean, Carl Rogers, he called um, some of those, you know, by different terms, he called them empathy, congruence and unconditional positive regard, but actually it's empathy, authenticity and respect is what they mean. And really, this should be given to every member of staff as a matter of course, no matter who they are. And, um, you know, if, if the member of staff has come to the union, then you can bet they're not getting it from their line manager. And I think if they're not getting these core conditions, it's good to call the management out, because if the management is not showing empathy with empathy with their staff, is not respectful and is not authentic in their dealings. These are the cornerstones of bully culture, toxic culture. And, you know, um, if uh, if everybody could be shown um, empathy, authenticity and respect, it would be um, a major weapon in the um, arsenal against bullying, which, um, as, as you know, is a very stressful experience. And then um, to go on and explore relationships in the life of members, 
you know, relationships with their work colleagues, with friends, with family. And in personal cases, these can often be fractured. So, um, you know, once that is known, it gives the rep an opportunity to adapt their relational style to the member, because I think that's an important component of the effectiveness of the member rep relationship, what the quality of that relationship is like. And obviously we want to help uh, reps have the best possible relationship with the members that they're representing. And then finally, exploring the attitudes and values and beliefs of the member. Uh, and this will help the member decide what it is they actually want, because, you know, many people come to the union and, you know, they've, they've got some kind of um, a grievance or feeling of injustice, but they're not really quite sure what outcome they want. And an exploration of their attitudes, values and beliefs will perhaps help them identify what outcomes they are, are hoping to, to gain. And um, also it will allow consideration of any kind of mental health um, issues or personality issues that the member may have. Okay, can we have the next slide, please? So um, then another thing to consider is um, the existential analysis, the four dimensions of existence. And that will hopefully um, uh, shine a light on the person's kind of inner world, you know, what their drivers are and um, why they are kind of going in the direction that they're going. So um, this theory of the four dimensions of existence was proposed by philosopher Emmy Van, Van, Van Dersen, who's an existential philosopher. And she um, proposes that our existence is divided into four dimensions. Firstly, the personal, the relationship with the self. And, you know, this covers self-concept, what the person thinks about themselves, what, what their view of their strengths and weaknesses and abilities are, you know, their self-confidence, is their confidence strong? Or do they live with blame and shame, you know, blame themselves, have shame issues? And do they have an internal or external locus of evaluation? which means, do they have um, a strong sense of self-worth? Do they evaluate themselves by their own measures or are they reliant on um, the measures of others and yardsticks of others like management and authority figures to determine their sense of self-worth? And then the social dimension, the relationships with others uh, at the workplace, family, friends and partners, you know, is this mostly good? Is it problematic? And if it's problematic, why is it problematic? And then the physical environment, which um, covers external life factors, such as debt, housing, transport facilities, where they live and work. And, you know, do they, uh, have they, um, are in, they, they're in the midst of environments with racism, sexism, disability, discrimination, homophobia, whatever, you know, what is their environment like? And finally, um, how they deal with their, their beliefs in the spiritual environment. Um, do they have religious beliefs? How do they engage with them? Um, or if they have no beliefs and sometimes spiritual beliefs are real support and sometimes they can be a source of self-limiting behavior. So what role that plays in the person's life is, is very important. And you know, considering all these aspects personally as a rep, I found it very helpful in defending dismissal cases because you can unearth all sorts of mitigating factors that you didn't know were there, were there by going through these things with, um, with the, the member and their perspectives at the management side don't usually consider, so they can be game-changing. Okay, if we could go on to the next slide, please. Then um, on to living in bad faith, and uh, that's obviously another source of stress. And uh, with authenticity, it's a concept famously, famously discussed by French existential philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre. And it means being true to yourself, being real in the moment, where your conscience and beliefs match your actions, and how much of that do we see at work. Um, so acting against your conscience and beliefs being and being inauthentic is what Sartre called living in bad faith, and that can be very stressful. 
And uh, then the German philosopher Heidegger proposed an idea of ontic and ontological anxiety. And ontic anxiety, um, he said, was everyday anxiety about everyday issues. And ontological anxiety was about deeper existential issues. So with ontic anxiety, they are um, stresses about, will I get into trouble at work? Can I pay the bills? And ontological anxiety is where people are thinking, will I lose my known world? Will my life as I know it change? Will I survive it all? And it was said that ontic and ontological anxiety is like an onion, that the outer layers are ontic. And if you peel them back at the heart of it, you will find ontological ex existential anxiety. So once again, once you have these discussions, with members, what their real inner drivers are, it can be very helpful in getting to the heart of their issues. And then suppressed emotions and feeling fake, two unhappy bedfellows here, avoidance and denial. And uh, often people who, um, you know, are, are in trouble, they, they don't want to take action or they take action too late or, or whatever because they think if they ignore issues, they'll just go away. So many members might need support in taking the action because, you know, avoidance and denial, it's, it's like a, a defense mechanism. And uh, sometimes it's really helpful to help people get through that so that they can confront their issues. And then finally, inauthentic responses in the workplace. And, um, you know, at a, an online training course recently, um, I heard a, a rep put in a question, um, which was, my management speaking rudely to me and being disrespectful is stressful. What can I do? And the answer it was fine. It was like a medicalized type answer. So stand back, do deep breathing, acknowledge your fight flight response, do emotional self-regulation. And um, I would say, yeah, well, that's fine. But I'll take a more holistic view and say, you know, have a look at the environment, have a look at what's actually going on. What is actually going on is the management being disrespectful and rude and, you know, rude management equals bullying. So address the bullying and, you know, take control and, and you know, address what the issue actually is. And uh, Tracy and uh, Sam and myself have done a video on bullying. If anybody's interested in, in watching that, where we've kind of put forth on some suggestions on that one, too. So, um, yeah, if we could go on to the next slide, please. So um, in summary, authentic responses to stress, um, address the, the, identify the core issues, use analysis to identify that fear or what that issue really is. Is it coercive control? Is it bullying? It's important to get to the real root of it. And then self-empowerment, you know, take control, call out stressors and uh, pr proactively take, uh, address the stress but by taking some action. And I know that Tracy's got some very good ideas about, um, you know, stress committees and stress groups to, to try and, and, you know, address this very point going forward. So if we could have the next slide, please. Yes, and now we are going on to, to trauma, the second subject of uh, our evening tonight. So trauma and emotional response to a terrible experience. This can be any experience that overwhelms your thoughts, emotions or body. So there are three types of trauma, acute trauma, which results from a single incident, chronic trauma, which is repeated and prolonged exposure to terrible experiences and a complex trauma, varied multiple traumatic events of an invasive personal nature. So, um, if we could go on to the next slide, please. And, uh, you know, here are the effects of trauma. And after experiencing trauma, a person may go into shock and denial in the short term. In the longer term, they might show symptoms, you know, the listed symptoms, um, many of which are similar to stress, but, um, you know, more intense. And, um, you know, additionally, such things as kind of hypersensitivity, hypervigilance, flashbacks as well as the unpredictable emotions, sleep disturbance, and so forth. Okay, if we could go to the next slide, please. And uh, so people who are 
exposed to prolonged trauma can get post-traumatic stress disorder, intense or prolonged psychological distress at exposure to internal or external cues that symbolize or resemble an aspect of the traumatic uh, events. So causes of PTSD are thought to be stressful experiences. And, you know, there's no limit on that. What's stressful for some people can, you know, seem not so stressful to the others. But it's, you know, it's a person-centered view how the stress affects the person. And, you know, people who have undergone you know, prolonged and intense you know, bouts of bullying feel that they have experienced PTSD as well. That's that's not uncommon. And then obviously people who have um, uh, inherited mental health, the risks or predisposition to mental health, the risks, um, they are more vulnerable, um, as are certain personality types and, you know, in individuals. The, the makeup of their, their brain chemistry can also um, make them more vulnerable to PTSD than others. So, um, you know, when talking about, you know, occupational health assessments, it is uh, important to be mindful that everyone is different and, you know, not to minimise the person who is having a dreadful reaction may well have been traumatised by events at work and may well have PTSD. So I think that's definitely one to, to bear in mind. OK, if we could have the next slide, please, Tracy. Right. Risk factors for PTSD, experiencing intense or long lasting trauma. OK, so if you have um, prolonged bullying or coercive control or people being forced to do things repeatedly in the workplace, well, that's a risk factor for PTSD, most certainly. Job exposure to traumatic events, and I mean some jobs in, you know, PCS members, they are very, you know, exposed to traumatic events, all those, you know, people who died crossing the boats to, to Calais and all that, our members definitely are, you know, exposed in various contexts to traumatic events and, you know, that can cause PTSD and obviously having other mental health issues where if somebody is depressed or anxious anyway, that then a stressful event may have, you know, may increase the, increase the risk factor of them getting PTSD and obviously substance misuse and um, isolation, which um, I believe before the discussion started, there was talk about the impact of COVID and that is still very much on people's minds that um, isolation was a big feature of that and still is and, and obviously needs to be noted as a risk factor. OK, if we could have the next slide, please. So common events leading to PTSD, we have, you know, combat exposure, which is well known, childhood abuse, sexual abuse, physical assault, something that our members, you know, could deal with professionally on a regular basis, being threatened with a weapon. And, you know, the, the weapon is in there to emphasize the level of the threat. You know, it's not just a case of someone shouting, I'm going to sue you. It is it can be quite heavy duty and obviously witnessing or being involved in an accident. OK, if we could have the next slide, please. Right. So symptoms of, of PTSD. Um, so intrusive memories and flashbacks that people will be triggered by going back into the work environment where the incident happened. You know, it will bring back memories for, to them. And also, you know, quite routine things. If somebody has been traumatized, like, you know, putting on their uniform, putting on their handcuffs, whatever it is that, you know, they were doing or they would do um, at the time of, of being traumatized, that can obviously bring back intrusive um, memories and um, flashbacks. And then, you know, as we discussed, avoidance, uh, negative changes in mood and thinking. So you can have quite kind of extreme changes there. And, you know, people at work, they can also kind of find themselves if they have got PTSD symptoms being on the receiving end of misconduct charges because they have, um, you know, had a mood swing and perhaps, you know, shouted something not very respectful at a colleague or, or reacted to, to a, a customer or passenger or something in, in you know, a, a way that isn't exactly commensurate with the civil service code. And uh, they may well be suffering from um, symptoms of PTSD. So it's important to, to, you know, not to exclude that. 
And then obviously changes in physical and emotional reactions, people becoming withdrawn, friends and relatives saying, oh, you know, you've changed since X, Y and Z happened. So um, all things to to kind of look out for with PTSD. And can the next slide, please. And then trauma induced responses, people with PTSD um, may respond to trauma in slightly different ways you know, and, and in, in kind of quite self-damaging ways. So we talked about the uh, fight, flight and the freeze response. And with a trauma induced response, there's another theory where um, fawn has also been added, which kind of interested me quite a lot. Um, and that is, you know, with the fight response, there's like a positive response to it. So in response to the threat, um, the, the person, the member or the rep can create boundaries, be assertive, find some courage and motivation to fight and protect yourself and, and those you care about or the community, whatever, where necessary. But an unhealthy fight, fight response can result in controlling behavior, narcissistic tendencies, bullying, conduct disorder, demanding perfection from others and feelings of entitlement. So, you know, that is also a response, but that's obviously a very, you know, unhealthy one. And then with flight, you know, um, a more healthy response is disengage from harmful conversations, you know, walk away, leave unhealthy relationships, remove yourself from physically dangerous situations and to properly assess danger. But unhealthy flight responsive can be responses can be obsessive compulsive tendencies needing to stay busy at all times, panic and constant fear, perfectionism, workaholic tendencies, inability to sit still. So, you know, things that we may see in the workplace, which are um, kind of important to um, look out for. And then with the positive freeze response, um, there, there's mindfulness, awareness, and, and full presence in the moment to consider things. And uh, with unhealthy freeze, uh, there's disassociation, isolation, frequent zoning out, brain fog, difficulty making decisions or taking actions and perceived laziness. And for people, you know, who have experienced um, traumatic events at work or, or been in a toxic environment for a long time, you know, they do zone out. And they have been, you know, have been perceived as, you know, lazy or not pulling their weight and all that. And really, they could um, they could be suffering from um, trauma or PTSD. So that's important to bear it in mind. And finally, the fawn response, which I found a bit interesting. And, um, you know, these things seem, seems to affect people pleasers who spend a lot of time around toxic individuals and they learn to go above and beyond to make the toxic person happy and thus neutralize the threat. And you know, this results in codependent relationships, staying in abusive relationships, loss of self, people pleasing to the point of destruction and little or no boundaries. And I do think that's particularly important in the workplace because um, I'm sure as, as you know, trade unionists, we have all seen people at work who are so intimidated by some of the doings of management, they fall into these type of behaviours. And if we can identify that, that someone is feeling so bullied that they're going into fawn mode, you know, we can really help them recognise that and perhaps build up their, their resilience and their self-concept and, and perhaps help them, you know, find the, the kind of inner strength to resist, which, um, which obviously is a, a really good thing. So um, yeah, if we could have the, the last slide then, please. So how can we help? Yeah, firstly, you know, talk to people because they may not be recognizing what's going on for them. They may be feeling awful, not realize they're suffering from stress, not realizing perhaps they got that they've got PTSD or maybe having an unhealthy response to um, one of the stressors that we discussed. So identifying that the stressor and the problem and the issue and, and really naming it, um, that was really important in helping people move forward um, and, you know, identifying any underlying issues. You know, if they've been overloaded with work and they can't cope, is the underlying issue bullying or coercive control? And um, 
also encourage the use of medical and psychological support offered. And, you know, in some research that um, I've been doing lately, um, the union members didn't use um, the employee assistance programme because they didn't trust it because it was too closely associated with management. But people who did found it really helpful. And I think that perhaps um, the uh, health and safety reps can be um, a bit of a, a gateway to the members accessing these things because, um, you know, they're not always and trusted or confident enough to do it. And then obviously consider reasonable adjustments in, in perhaps a psychologically based way and, you know, um, ask for things which are slightly unusual if it will help the member. I mean, why not? Chances are that um, if you've got a reasonable occupational health psychologist, they may well support them and uh, which obviously always puts some pressure on management, which is good. And then for reps, evaluate the stress levels of caseload and, you know, be mindful of emotional contagion. Are you taking on too much? Is this issue too complex? Are the issues that are being raised too emotionally stressful for you? And uh, be mindful of effects of transference and projection. So are you having emotions and quite strong emotions loaded onto you? And is that having a knock on on your personal and work life? And, you know, um, also to encourage good self-care practice um, for reps, you know, only for members, but for reps as well. And I know um, Tracy had some really good ideas on that, on um, organizing kind of groups to where, where reps could support each other in terms of mental health well-being. And so I will leave it there. There's a final slide which Tracy will send out, which are um, basically references, some of the core references for this presentation. If anybody wants to dig in deeper, you know, there it is. And um, so anyway, thank you very much for listening. And I'm happy to answer any questions or discuss anything anybody wants to talk about.